Good morning, everybody. Both here and um, online. It's really good to see you, to be with you. Um, This morning, we're going to start our time, our service uh, together this morning with some musical worship. Um, So if you'd you'd like to, if you're able to, please um, stand. Um, Yeah, this is just a a way of us um, aligning aligning our hearts, opening our hearts to um, the presence of God, to um, to what God wants to, might want to be saying to us this morning. Um, we we want to declare that um, we love God and we want to know what He has for us, um, and we are open to all that He um, wants to do in our lives. So let's um, lift our praises to Jesus this morning.
love you and we open our hearts to you this morning and we are um, open and willing and ready to hear what it is that you want to um, say to us this morning to hear how you might want to challenge us or encourage us yeah lord we lift our time up this morning we pray that you would bless this time of community together Awesome. Good morning and welcome again to the Shore Community Church. I'm Nick. I'm one of the ministers here. It's great to have all of you guys here and however many of you are online as well. Uh, There's a few different things we're wanting to share with you. Uh, A reminder again that this Thursday evening we have our church uh, meeting. It's uh, AGM um, and it will be in person and over Zoom as well. Uh, We're going to be sharing lots of different things within that uh, time. And one of those is going to be talking about lottery funding. That's a conversation that's been ongoing for some time. And there will be uh, voting that takes place. Um, But just a reminder to you guys that you can only vote if you're here in person uh, and a member as well. Um, So there is limited spaces in the church. So do be booking in for that. It's all available on church suite at the moment and we're also going to be ratifying uh, the new church leaders so that will be um, Dan Clark and Jess and Dave Lacey as well so we'd already uh, kind of informally invited them as church leaders over Zoom so we're going to be ratifying that on Thursday as well. Also a notice for kids church families um, that there is going to be a treasure hunt taking place on Sunday the 16th, so that's next Sunday at 2pm and uh, you're all going to be meeting at West Park Cafe Um, and apparently the request is please bring a pen, a clipboard and a plastic bag. I have no idea why um, but I'm sure that will be some great fun. So that is 2 o'clock next Sunday at West Park Cafe. So any of the kids' church families, um, please do come along to that. I'm sure it would be great fun. Uh, Also a notice about life groups. So it is actually today, finally, Sign Up Sunday. Whee! That was better than I anticipated, actually. (laughs) Um, So Sign Up Sunday is where we officially sign up to our life groups. What we would normally do if it wasn't COVID times would we would have all of the different leaders of the life groups out in the church lounge, which is now becoming the church cafe, um, and people would be signing up. Uh, Obviously, we can't do that in person, um, but what we're asking you to do is to sign up online. The the life groups are up online on Church Suite. If you need any help with that, do get in contact with us. Uh, But we have a few uh, exciting life groups lined up. Um, So just uh, quickly running through those different life groups, we have Impossible Questions. And that is going to be taking place over Zoom on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., starting this Tuesday. Um, So do sign up to that online. There's some interesting questions lined up. I think the one for this Tuesday is, can you go to the toilet in heaven? So some very important, vital questions to be asked there. Um, But yeah, you're really welcome to book in and join in with that. Um, If you want any more details, get in contact with uh, Izzy Ball about that. Uh, Also, there is a life group that is a prayer for the persecuted church. Uh, This has taken place a few times over the past year, and it is is continuing now. So that is on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and that's also over Zoom. Once again, all the details on Church Suite. Uh, There is a a women's group that meets on Fridays, um, and at the moment they are meeting on Fridays at 9 o'clock outside the church, and then I believe they're, they're walking somewhere Uh, together. So if you'd like to join in with that, um, do sign up online. Um, And there is also going to be, uh, over the next six, seven, eight weeks, uh, there's going to be a life group where they will be praying into uh, the Shore Cafe that is being set up. Um, So that group is all about just any, any news, any things that need praying for for the cafe, and just 
uh, really praying into that space, that that will be a real um, wonderful space where it will be completely centered on people's well-being and, and nurturing uh, people physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, so to be really praying into that cafe, it's something that we've been talking about for a long time, but we're excited about that actually becoming a reality. So this is going to be taking place fortnightly on Mondays over Zoom at 7.45 p.m. So that is because every other Monday we have our usual prayer meeting, which has just reminded me, this Monday, tomorrow evening, we have our usual prayer meeting at 7.45. Um, in those prayer meetings over the next uh, month or so, we're going to be specifically praying for the cafe at different points within that as well. So that means every other Monday, there is the, um, the usual prayer meeting, and then the Mondays in between, uh, there is the uh, prayer meeting specifically for the Shore Cafe. Um, so once again, details online for the Zoom link for that as well. Um, so that will be starting next Monday. Uh, and then finally, there is a walking life group um, that's going to be taking place. Uh, the first one of those will be on Tuesday, the 8th of June. I don't feel like I even need to do a call out for this, though, because the numbers for that already are just astronomical. Um, but the details are on Church Suite, of course. Uh, but I'm going to be handing over to John now, who's just going to be sharing a little more around the AGM and the offering as well. Good morning, everybody. Morning, people at church. Morning, people at home. It's great to be here. I can't remember the last time I was here, but uh, looking at the number of empty seats, I shall make it a point of mine to come a little more often. Now I know there's space. Um, I'm really looking forward to us opening up as a church sometime soon. And, you know, obviously we need to be cautious. We need to follow guidelines. It'll be wonderful to worship back here together. I'm not sure what the new normal will look like, but... Um, it's going to be a step forward, I'm sure. Well, look, I'm here really to plug the AGM, which is an actual general meeting, not just a virtual general meeting, although it will be both. Um, it is the most important uh, meeting of the year from a governance viewpoint. Um, everybody's welcome. Um, you know, only members can vote, but you're welcome to join us here in the building. You're welcome to join us online. Uh, we'll be talking about the budget and the vision and the plans for our church in 2021. And from a budgetary viewpoint, I'm gonna send out information tomorrow to everybody on the mailing list. So um, if you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to see a copy of that, please speak to Carla or send her an email. But I'd really like everybody who's interested to be able to read that in advance of the, the AGM. Um, if you want to ask me questions of clarification or anything in advance of the AGM, be my guest, I'll do my very best to, if there's anything that's not clear on that report, just to answer that um, uh, before or during the general meeting. Now, I think it was St. Ignatius, it could have been St. Augustine, who said, pray as if everything depends on God, act as if everything depends on you. And I have to say, in the natural, there's a gap between what our funds are doing at the moment and what our vision is saying. Now, fortunately, we got a supernatural God, a God who owns everything. And, you know, I really want to explore that more. There will be some more details in the uh, letter going out tomorrow. We'll have an opportunity to talk about it online. But in the natural, you know, as church treasurer, I might be saying, oh, I'm really cautious about some of this money spending. Uh, where's it going to come from? Uh, our offerings at the moment are, are running behind what they were last year. Um, with God's help, I believe, and we believe as a leadership, that, that the vision God is calling us to um, is not about just looking at the money. We need to be careful stewards of the money. It's about what is he calling us to do as a church and a community. So let me finish in the words of, um, of Alan Partridge. Be there, be online. Be part of the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> We're going to continue our um, musical worship time together by singing a few songs together. 
Um, once again, just encourage you where, wherever you are to engage in whatever way you um, feel you would most connect. So if that's stood, if that's sat down, if that is eyes closed, eyes open, hands up, hands down, whatever. And um, whatever way you um, feel you need to connect with God, if you want to use these words as prayer, um, then please do. Um, this, is, um, this is your time, our time, God's time um, to, um, to do his thing. So um, let's, let's share together now.
verse this morning before we head into our, our next song um, we sing the next song um, uh, quite often um, and there's uh, the line of letting incense arise and so I, I, I just looked a little bit more into that this week um, and wanted to bring you a verse from um, Malachi chapter 1 um, verse 11 
which says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations, and in every place incense shall be offered to my name, and indeed a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. I think um, over and over again in the Bible it um, talks of um, incense being an offering to God and, and incense being a, an illustration of worship, um, of prayer. Um, yeah, that it's, it's not it's a, it's a sweet smell as a, as a metaphor, as an illustration of um, how we want to live our lives for Jesus and how um, we want to bring more than a song. Um, we want to bring ourselves and we want to offer our lives up to you and to his purpose for us, for this church, for this community, for this world. Um, So I think as we we sing this next song, a familiar song, um, I just want to pray that this morning, that we as a community would um, let our incense arise, uh, rise up to Jesus, rise up to God, Lord, that we just, yeah, Lord, we just um, offer our lives to you.
that we can gather here this morning to hear from you and um, just pray that as um, Jamie speaks this morning you would be revealing to us how we can bring you more than a song how we can worship you with our lives in mind, body and soul Lord I just, um, yeah, just lift Jamie to you and pray that his words would be yours and that we would hear from you Amen You okay? So much to do. Got to unplug this, replug that, change, pick this up, switch that on, log into that. Chat amongst yourselves. Well, don't, no, don't actually, because socially distanced and all that. Wave at one another. <laughs> thanks, Hannah. Thanks, band. Thanks, technical people. Great job. Um, we are getting back into our series about Acts, Act Now. We're going to be in this for the next sort of four or five weeks, maybe, just dipping back into, if you remember where we got to before, um, we started looking at the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. You find it just after the Gospels in your New Testament. And um, it's a fascinating book because what it is, if you recall, go back and, and listen to that, maybe that first session, if you want to just have a refresher on kind of how I see what the Acts of the Apostle actually is and how it works and what the major themes are. It might be worth just revisiting that. It'll help to put some of this into context. Um, but it's essentially, it's an account of the early church, of the Acts of the Apostles, starting with Jesus' resurrection, basically, and his ascension into heaven. And then it's kind of what happened next. But sometimes people will say it's a history, and it is a history, but it's an ancient history. And I think it's really helpful to understand that. So the way they wrote history back in the day was not the way that you'd be expected to write history today, for example. Um, it's, uh, it's ancient history. They were less concerned with like reporting the facts and giving a sense of kind of biographical information as we would be, uh, and they were more concerned with conveying meaning. They were quite happy to kind of edit things out and and kind of uh, create sort of like um, composites and that sort of thing in order to get the point across. Because the, the important thing to the way they wrote history, was the important thing. They wanted to convey the important thing, the, the important meaning that they wanted to get across. They weren't bothered with, well, you know, uh, Paul was a fisherman and he was born in this year and his birthday was on X, Y, Z and, you know, he liked cats and, you know, um, his favourite colour was blue and they were, they were just not concerned with the kind of biographical data that perhaps we would be concerned with uh, if we were writing it today. Less about reportage, less about journalism. Um, they were more concerned with meaning. And like, meaning itself is a bit of a slippery word, isn't it? Because it's a funny thing. You can talk about what, what is the meaning of an event. It, could, it can be the original meaning. What, what was the original meaning for those folks back there? For Luke, uh, as he wrote this book, as we, as we talked about last time, we believe it was Luke that wrote the Acts of the Apostle. It's the second part of his gospel, the Gospel of Luke. And... Um, is, he, is the first concern about meaning, about what he originally meant, or what, what or, sorry, what, what originally happened in the events that he's describing. So he's describing some events. What was the original meaning of those events? And then there's a second layer, which is what's Luke's meaning in the way that he's composed this material? What does he want us to pick up from his book? 
But thirdly, and most importantly for me, and what I want to get across to us today, is the third level of meaning. And they're all, they're all true and they're all necessary, but I think the third level of meaning that's really important is to remember that this is a living word. This, this Bible, this book that we come back to, the scriptures, it's a living word. It's a living word. We often say that, oh, yes, it's a living word. Yeah, it's a living word. No, it's a living word. It's alive. Living things move. <laughs> living things do things. You know, if you were looking at, you know, a squirrel, and it was, oh, I was just about to go parrot there. It's a, it's a deceased parrot. I was just effortlessly segueing into Monty Python. But no, we'll stick with my original vision, which was squirrel. If there was a squirrel on the floor, and it wasn't moving, and it was ah, like this, and it wasn't breathing, and it wasn't doing anything... You wouldn't say that was a living squirrel. That would not be your first impression. You'd probably, you could say it's a squirrel that's very good at, you know, lying still, and perhaps it's a mime, perhaps it's... No, it's a dead squirrel. Living things do things. That's today's big message. Thank you, you've been awesome. Um, Brad, no, okay. Living things do things. What's the meaning to us today? What is this word trying to say to us now? That's really important. Today, in Bogner, in 2021, it might be this, we could preach about this passage that I'm going to preach about later. We could be preaching about it in London or Nottingham or Timbuktu, or we could be preaching about it five years ago or five years in the future, and it would mean something different because the Holy Spirit is doing something different with this living word. But to come back to the book of Acts... If you wanted like a one-verse summary of what the whole book is kind of about and where it's going, you find it in chapter 1 and verse 8, when Jesus is speaking to the disciples just before he ascends into heaven. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be, with, be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That basically, in one verse, is everything that then happens in the book of Acts. You, you're my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes. Sorry, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you receive power, and then you'll be my witnesses. First of all, in Jerusalem, that's largely what we were talking about last time. The first chapters that talk a lot about Jerusalem, and we're going to be picking that up in a minute. And then Judea and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. That's the trajectory. That's where it's going. So we're going to come. Remember, last time we sort of wrapped things up around chapter six. Uh, Nick did the last one just before Christmas. Uh, but the next few chapters, where we're going next, it's all about kind of a crisis uh, in the church, in that early church movement. How, it's about how suffering and how strife and how wrestling with difficult questions forged the church. That's what this next little sequence is about. So the first little six chapters is kind of intro, and it's about how the Holy Spirit came upon the, uh, the disciples. Uh, the apostles, and then this next section is about a conflict, it's about a crisis that in some ways was absolutely crucial in forging the church. And it's worth reflecting for us all the time about how creative tensions at best or suffering or pain or difficult, uh, difficulties, sorry, it's, it's worth for us to reflect how pain and how difficulty and how crisis and how conflict sometimes can actually be ripe with possibilities, can be ripe with creative tension. And that's not something that we want, it's not something we like, but if you're going through a tough time, when you are going through a tough time, it's, it's often easy, it, naturally we just think, well I just want to get out of it, I want to get through this, I want to get beyond this and back to the, you know, the sunlit uplands. But very often it's in exactly those moments of difficulty that you grow, that you are forged, that new possibilities, new, new creative possibilities become apparent to you. It's, it's those times that we're forged in the fire, we're refined in the fire, if you like. Who knows a little bit about what I'm talking about? Who can think about difficult moments in their lives and know that actually that was a dreadful period, but goodness me, I grew in that time. It really made me. It's worth in that reflecting all the time on how the Holy Spirit works. We must meditate on how the Holy Spirit works. He is unfathomable. We might not be able to understand it. What is going on? God, why are you putting me through this? What is happening? The work of the Holy Spirit can be unfathomable to our eyes, but it is also unconquerable. It's unfathomable, but it's unconquerable. Wherever we, however we might be going through a situation, we think, what on earth is going on? But if we give ourselves to God, if we allow the Holy Spirit to move us, even through those times, 
we will find that the work of God comes to fruition. It is unconquerable. So this week, as I um, put in my first slide, uh, this talk is called Chain Reaction. Uh, you see what I've done there, the word act, seamlessly plugged into the middle of it. And um, if you remember where we left it last time, beginning of chapter 6, the apostles had a bit of a distribution problem. People weren't getting the fair share. Remember, they shared everything together, they brought all their possessions together, and then they divvied it up amongst that community. But some people complained, the, more, the Hellenic people, the people with a Jewish, uh, sorry, with a Greek background, saying, hey, look, we're not getting fair dibs here. Um, it seems like there's a bit of favoritism going on, and the people with a more Jewish background, a, 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 a more Hebrew, they were the Hebrew Jews as opposed to the Greek Jews, if you like. There were sort of two different cultures mixing together. And it, they felt, that the Greek Jews felt that they weren't getting a fair shout. So the apostles appointed some guys, um, six people, to, sorry, seven people, to uh, look after the distribution of food. And within that, we have this chap, Stephen, who's introduced. He's one of this seven. Um, Stephen is introduced. And um, it seems that the word Stephen would suggest that he was one of these Hellenic people. In fact, all of the seven, it sounds like they've got Greek names. So it's like the apostles are saying straight away, there seems to be this imbalance in our kind of cultural makeup. We're going to positively discriminate. We're going to lift up and anoint people who are going to really understand where you're coming from and make a real difference. And that's important. Um, Basically, I'm going to go through Stephen's story today, making because it stretches over from the second half of chapter 6 to the beginning of chapter 8. So I'm going to kind of just go through it and make little comments. I'm not going to read every verse out or comment in every verse because I think that would, that would slow us down too much. But Stephen is introduced straight away as one of these sevens who, who's going to be part of solving this administrative problem of giving out bread. The interesting thing is that they never talk about those guys again in that context. They never say, and then, you know, Philip was really good at administration and did X, Y, Z. No, these guys are amazing. They are, as it says here, Stephen is introduced as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He was full of grace and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. These people were preachers. They were prophets. Yes, they had amazing administrative gifts, Maybe, I don't know, maybe that power and those great wonders were exerted through those administrative gifts or alongside those gifts. We don't know, but these, these people are held up as being very much in the, in the, in the uh, spirit of the apostles. They have the gifting of apostles, although they're not called that. And it's also worth noting that great prophetic power, great authority, great leadership ability is rooted in service. These seven guys were appointed to serve, to give out bread, to make sure everyone had their fair allocation of the community's resources. They were servants. Like, um, like the, the apostle say, is it right for us to wait in, on tables? So a lot, a lot of the implication being these guys literally waited on tables. They gave out food. They served people. And they were, their leadership, their ap apostolic power was rooted in the fact that they were servants, first of all. If you ever feel that you might have gifts to bring to the church, to be, um, ex uh, to be, to be uh, expressed in a leadership capacity, that's amazing, that's wonderful, but it must always be rooted in service. If you think it's great to be a Christian leader because of the glamour, can I just disappoint you straight away? <laughs> All the leaders in the house go, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Stephen, he's an amazing guy, but he comes into co conflict very quickly. And it's interesting, he comes into conflict with some Hellenistic Jews, some Greek culture Jews, kind of his own, his own side of that cultural split. And I, I don't know why that feels significant, but it feels significant to me somehow that Stephen, a, a guy with a, a Greek culture and background, comes a, one of these, these seven leaders, and he comes into conflict with other Jews, but, and it specifically mentions Jews with a Greek background. Why should they be so, I don't know, kind of, kind of sensitive, oversensitive to what, to what Stephen and the others were saying and doing? Why are they particularly like veriferous? I, 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 I sometimes, vociferous. Veriferous? That's not even a word. It sounds, like a, it sounds like it should be a good word. Veriferous. Vociferous. Why should they be so worked up better? 
about what Stephen is about. And I wonder sometimes if, and I can't help but reflect that perhaps in some of our Christian traditions, some of our, our, our Protestant tradition particularly, sometimes we can be very late to the party. We can be very dismissive of tradition. We can be very dismissive of the riches and the depth and the wisdom that existed before. You know, we've just turned up. We've just launched this church. We're fantastic. We know it all. And, and those people can be the most intolerant, the most overbearing, the most fundamentalist in the wrong sense of the word about what they believe about God. They can be aggressive and violent and kind of miss the point, as we shall see. Anyway, I don't know why it's significant. It just feels significant, so I thought I'd mention it. And they um, accuse him. They say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Now, that's somewhat interesting. Um, Moses represents the law. So he's speaking against the law. That's what they mean by Moses. That's what they're meaning. And he's brought to the Jewish council. Um, and uh, kind of, it's, it's, it's basically a dirty business. You know, there's false witnesses brought in, and they uh, bring up trumped-up charges against him. They say things like this. This man never stops. He never stops saying things against this holy place, meaning the temple, and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Basically, you can't do things like that. That's not how we've always done things. This is, this is the church. This is the temple. This is how we do things. You're, you're threatening the institution. You're threatening the way we've always done things. The customs that were handed down to us from time immemorial. You get the sense of where their complaint is coming from. Here's this, Johnny come lately with all these jumped up ideas, part of this weirdo sect, and they're coming along and they're trying to rattle the foundations. They're trying to threaten the institution. That's what this, if you know the story and you know what happens next, be absolutely clear, that's what this is about. They were threatening the institution. They were threatening the rules. They were threatening the system. That's what they didn't like. Um, it's an addiction to religion. And Stephen's reply addresses this directly. And they ask him if this is so. And it says that he had the face of an angel as he began to reply. Which basically means he's got the face of someone who is speaking the word from heaven. He's bringing a message from heaven. So what comes next is a message from heaven. That's what Luke is trying to get over to us. And Stephen replies, and he actually gives the longest speech that's in the whole of the book of Acts. And the way that he answers these charges against him is he basically gives a history of the entire Israelite people, of God's people, right back to Abraham. And the theme throughout this speech, and please do read it if you have time this week, read from the second half of chapter 6 through to the beginning of chapter 8 so you really get the fullness of it. The theme throughout is, what is real faithfulness? Is real faithfulness found um, in a fixed institution, obeying the rules, following the old customs, keeping to the old practices, just keeping on doing what we've always done. Is that faithfulness? Faithfully, I mean, sometimes we use faithful in that sense, don't we? Just keeping on going, keeping on going. And there is always oh, a very faithful servant, and that's what we mean. And that's great, that's fantastic. But in the sense of where is the Spirit, where is the Holy Spirit of God, the question is, is it found in those rooted traditions or is it found in following, in being sensitive to, in listening to, in passionately seeking the ever-moving, ever-changing, ever-creative Holy Spirit of God? Spirit, breath, wind, it's the same word in both Greek and Hebrew, ruach or pneuma. It can mean breath, it can mean spirit, it can mean wind. It's a moving thing inherently. It brings life. Remember the difference between a living word and a dead word that I started with? The Holy Spirit must inhabit the word for it to be life and alive. So far from uh, blaspheming God and Moses, as one writer suggests, Luke is saying that they are more faithful to God than their opponents by reading the biblical story in terms not of commandments and shrines, but in terms of promise and fulfillment of prophetic sendings 
and the challenge to obedience. He's saying, you know, this story that you've been part of, that we read about in what we call the Old Testament, this story, it's not about shrine, it's not about shrines, it's not about commandments, it's not about institutions, it's about prophetic sendings. It's about the challenge to obedience when something new and challenging and threatening perhaps comes along. It's about promise. It's about fulfillment. It's not in these sorts of hard, rigid things. It's in something far more out there. And of course, that feels risky and it feels dangerous, but it's absolutely essential. So he tells the story, and I'll I'll sort of breeze through it quite quickly. He starts right back with Abraham, and he says about how it was the spirit that guided Abraham to leave his own land and to seek another land. And crucially, that was rooted in, uh, it wasn't rooted in an inheritance. It wasn't rooted in a guarantee, as Stephen says. It was not rooted in the past. It was rooted in a future promise. He wasn't setting out because he knew he was coming into something. He was uh, like an inheritance. He was setting out because there was a promise of something completely unseen, something that was in the future. It was a spirit-driven movement. Um, and then it moves on about how the, the patriarchs rejected Joseph. Joseph, this dreamer, this kind of guy who had these wacky ideas. And, the, you know, the story, maybe you know the story um, of, of Israel's sons, the 12. And they hate Joseph because he thinks he's, you know, he tells them what his dreams are all about. I won't tell the whole story. You can, you can look it up. But they hate him. They reject him. They rejected this dreamer. But God was with the dreamer. God was with Joseph. God showed him, in fact, he showered upon him his favour and his wisdom. Moses, it moves on, and and most of um, of, uh, Stephen's story is about Moses' story. He mentions that Moses was full of wisdom and powerful deeds. Again, it's about what the Spirit is doing. More than they want to say, it's all about the commandments and the laws that Moses gave. Stephen says particularly that Moses believed that through him God was rescuing his people. That's Stephen's take on that story as reported by Luke. That God was rescuing his people. It wasn't just Moses was just showing up and all, you know, looking for something to do. That God was actually in Moses and Moses knew that, believed that God was rescuing his people. If you remember the story, maybe you've seen Prince of Egypt and you know there's, there's a fight going on with an overseer and some Israelites and Moses steps in. But nevertheless, Stephen says, they rejected Moses. They, he quotes the line, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? That's what the slave, enslaved Israelites said. Who made you a ruler? Who put you in charge? Who, and a judge, remember back in their idea, think of the book of judges. A judge doesn't mean just a bloke in a wig, you know, sitting in the law court. It's uh, a saviour like Samson. It's, a, it's a, somebody who fights, who, who, who kind of rules over and kind of governs um, the people. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? So he fled. He ran away. But 40 years later, God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and sent him back. And then we read in chapter 7 from verse 35, it was this Moses whom they had rejected when they said, who made you a ruler and a judge, and whom God now sent as both ruler and liberator. See, they said, who made you ruler and judge? Remember what judge means? And he's saying, God now sent back as ruler and liberator, which is like judge, through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. So in other words, who made you ruler and judge? God did. Thank you. He led them out, having performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And interestingly, Luke is creating an interesting parallel, I think, here. The two visitations of Moses, you know, where he came and was rejected and then sent away and then returned in power. What does that sound like? Like Jesus coming, being rejected, and then coming back in power through the power of the Holy Spirit that is being expressed through the apostles right now in this story. That's the story that's being told here. He's saying, remember, Moses initially rejected and then returns in power. Jesus rejected. Now, as we've seen, look at what's happening all around us. Look at what's happening with this this Jesus movement in Jerusalem right now, returning in power. The power that is being expressed through the apostles and through the church. Interesting parallel, perhaps? He says... 
He gave them living words, or some translations say living oracles. The Greek word is logion. It doesn't just mean the law. It could mean the whole of the Old Testament. It's a plural word. He gave them living words. Back to what we said about living word. Living oracles. This was an alive thing. It wasn't bound up in institution or rules. He's clearly contrasting it with anything fixed or lifeless in their understanding of the word law. But they were unwilling to obey him. They pushed him aside. In their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. They wanted to worship other gods, as he describes. They made the golden calf. They wanted to follow idols. They wanted to turn away from this living word to something that was known, that was in the past, that was, you know, back in Egypt, as it says, the way things were. Gods made out of of stone and gold and wood and that sort of thing. He goes on to talk about the tabernacle. Um, He talks about uh, Joshua um, and um, how the tabernacle uh, accompanied the people as they went and and, and conquered the the land of Canaan. He notes that it was um, David who then wanted to make God a temple. It's like, we can't have you wandering around in this sort of shabby tent-type arrangement. That doesn't seem quite fitting to your dignity, Lord. We want to make you a temple, and obviously it was Solomon that then did make the temple. But there's a, a, a deep um, kind of uneasiness with this move that comes through their own tradition, through the Jewish scriptures, because as Stephen relates, the reply is, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my, you know, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? What do you think you're going to do, says the Lord? Or or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So what, what kind of temple, what kind of house do you think you could make for me? I made all this. What are you, what are you doing? So say there's there's an uneasiness with the whole institution. So they're saying this is a terrible, terrible movement that's threatening the institution, threatening the temple, threatening the law. And he's saying all the way through our own tradition, our own story, if you read it right, tells us that this isn't what it's all about. It shouldn't be about this anyway. You've kind of missed the point. In fact, you've definitely missed the point. For them, the temple was so central The institution was so absolutely central that they have chosen the temple and they've rejected Jesus. You can't get away from, that's the crucial break point. It's like you have missed the point so massively that you're more in love with the bricks and the mortar and the institution and the tradition and God himself has come to us and you've said, no thank you. No, that's too messy, that's too weird. We like what we've got, thank you very much. So then he says to them, fighting talk, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. We could be a lot more hardcore, couldn't we, Nick, when we're preaching? I'm just thinking if 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 Stephen could get away with this. You, no, I'm not. I'm too nice. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. That's fighting talk, isn't it? You're not going to win many friends that way, are you? Hello. Derek's got a stone in his hand. That's why we don't talk like this, Nick. I've just remembered people chuck stones at you. Note to self. You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit. That's what this story has been about. Just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, sorry, when they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats 
at the feet of a, man, a young man named Saul. Incidentally, that little expression, they laid their coats, it kind of implies... Hello? I thought Nick was just waving at me and being friendly. How's that? Yes. Come on. You know the story. If something goes wrong, unplug it, plug it in again, switch it off, switch it back on. Can't go wrong. So that expression that they laid their coats at the feet of, of Saul, it kind of implies that Saul may have been the instigator of this whole plot, that he was the guy like, yeah, I'm, I'm in charge, I'll hold the coats. You know, he was kind of running the show. That kind of is suggested by that expression. Um... While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he died. There's clear parallels, aren't there? Anyone who's read in the Gospels the story of Jesus, clear parallels. You see, he, what does he do? He says, receive my spirit. Jesus says that. It says, don't hold this sin against them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Clear parallels. Luke is reminding us that this is what Jesus followers are like. Jesus followers are just like Jesus. You know, Jesus trusted himself to God. Jesus forgave his enemies. He didn't fight back. So when Jesus followers are faced with conflict, we trust God and we forgive our enemies as it says in, in Luke 6, love your enemies, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. It couldn't be more straightforward. It's not, yeah, well, that's okay for Jesus, but, you know, someone comes at me, I'm going to come out fighting. I'll let them know, I'll get my way. I'm not going to be pushed around. I'm, I mean, you know, we need to be careful about becoming a doormat sometimes, but there's a posture of the heart which is reflected in Luke 6. Love your enemies, do good. Do good to those who hate you. He hates me, well, do good to him. She's just been cursing me, she's been running me down, well, bless her. That person mistreated me, I don't think I'm getting fairly treated at all. Well, pray for them, pray for them. Pray blessing on them, pray for them. Not pray against them. Is this our reality? Is this our story as Jesus followers? And the story goes on in chapter 8. And Saul, who's going to be a very important character as we go forward in the story, if you know it, Saul approved of their killing him. And that day, that day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Does that ring a bell? Goes on to say a little bit later, Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. There's this junction point. We've now reached the junction point in the book of Acts. We've, we've reached the end of the beginning and we're going into the beginning of, well, the beginning of the middle, maybe not necessarily the beginning of the end. There's this junction point. The brewing conflict with the Jewish authorities has now exploded into outright persecution. But this persecution, this calamity, this crisis, this suffering, this hardship, this difficulty, this real pain is like the scattering of seeds, just like a dandelion. It's this, this, this dreadfulness, this awfulness, this in the human and in the flesh, something that we really wouldn't ever want. But it's this very thing that creates the movement that was prophesied by Jesus. It's in this that the church is forged. So coming into land now, and remember at the end of every uh, teaching in this series, what I try and do is come back to our theme, act now. And the point being, okay, that's a great story, but what do we, what do we take about, uh, from it today? What do, we, what do we need to do about that today? How do we bring the book of Acts and what we're learning into our context and our daily lives right now? First of all, I've got four really quick things. Catch the wind is the first one. Just like the sails on a ship. 
filling ourselves with the breath of God. When it comes to following Jesus, let me be as clear as I possibly can. When it comes to learning about God, when it comes to coming into relationship with God the Father following Jesus, there is simply nothing more important than discerning the Holy Spirit. Nothing. Everything else is death. The Holy Spirit is life. We must be spreading our sails. We must be opened up. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, okay, good question. There's a lot to explore there. But we must be discerning the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us life. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Breath that fills our sails. The Holy Wind that fills our sails and guides us and moves us through this life. Next point. Sacred cows. Is that coming through? In the flow of that spirit that I've just described, in the flow of that spirit, we must ask ourselves, have we got any of these? Have we become overshadowed by, or beholden to, or addicted to, or reliant on anything that could block, or that could divert, or that could choke out, or that could diminish, or that could replace that spirit? So we don't, we don't need the spirit because we've got X. If that was when I, when I made that first point if, and I said there's nothing more important than following the Holy Spirit, if there was anything that popped into your head and you said, yeah, but I don't need that because I've got X, be careful. That has every possibility of becoming like the temple became, like the particular customary interpretation of the law became to those people. Something that will diminish and choke out the spirit. But it's hard, isn't it? We've had several examples in this story, but I know it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for you. I know it's right, but I'm not suggesting that it's easy because we like familiarity. Of course we do. We like systems. We like formulas. We like predictability. We like things to be clean. We love our customs and our institutions. It's nice. We like moralism, nice, nice clear rules, nice guidelines, the nice people, the not naughty people, the good and the bad, nice clean we don't want that mess, the mess of relationship, the mess of being blown around by the Spirit. We like all that stuff. Of course we do. Religion. And I always use the term religion, generally speaking. Always generally, you know what I mean. Use the term religion in a negative context. I understand that people use it differently. But the, when I say religion, I mean the systematizing of relating to God. No, no, God, I don't need to relate to you because I've got this rule book. Thanks, cheers, bye. The minute we've got a system, we don't need to have the conversation anymore. Relationship brings us back to the present and the now and the relating. Religion gives us all of that comfort, but it is dangerous. It can be deathly. It's comfortable, but it's deathly. It's the sleep of death, either ours or other people's. And against this, the messiness of relationship, of listening, of breaking new ground, of exploring new things, of being prepared for the new wine that might well burst out of the wineskin, that can feel something that we want to hold back against. Next point. What stones are we throwing? Are we throwing any stones right now? Are we attacking anything? You know, it's easy when we read a story like that to imagine ourselves on the right side of the confrontation. We're there standing with Stephen, aren't we? We, we? we would do that, of course we would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to imagine ourselves there. But we need to challenge ourselves. I need to challenge myself all the time. The chances are I could find myself in the crowd ready to throw a stone. Because I can get so hung up on my rightness. I can get so hung up on, on my sacred cows What's, what's something that you grind your teeth at? What gets your goat? What gets you angry? What can't you tolerate? Think about it and then listen to the Spirit. Listen to this. Allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you or just to wash over you as you contemplate these things that you grind your teeth at. Is it really against his will? Are you angry about it because God's about it or is it actually that you feel uncomfortable about it? That I feel offended by it? Does, it, does this thing bring up some difficult stuff for me? So I don't like it, I hate it. And we just imagine that God agrees with us. That's a very dangerous place to be. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit just to move us and soften us and shape us. 
finally. Courage and sacrifice. This is clearly a part of Stephen's story. Maybe you've heard this, this piece of scripture uh, print, uh, preached about in the past and you can't not talk about this. He's called the first martyr, isn't he? Now, we might not be asked to pay the ultimate price like Stephen was, but we can't, we can't ignore the fact that walking this path, this path is likely to be costly. It will be hard sometimes, maybe a lot of the time. The idea that, you know, follow Jesus as your Lord and all your problems will disappear. Anyone, anyone that, that your experience? Yeah, I don't know if you can see this at home, but there's 0% of people have agreed with, yes, I follow Jesus and all my problems disappeared. Hallelujah. You know, he washes whiter than whites. Fantastic. No. That's not how it works. In fact, life can be more costly, more hard. But wisdom and strength and faithfulness and long-suffering and spiritual gold is forged in exactly those fires. Let me encourage you. And the Holy Spirit all the time is our guide. He not only is the wind that fills our sail and, and blows us to where we need to be, he's also our comforter. He gives us strength. He's our counsellor. And we talk about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, don't we, from 2 Corinthians. This is what we as the church aspire to be, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will be not just my wind filling my sails, but our breath giving us life. And together in this fellowship, we walk together. We comfort one another. We guide one another. We counsel one another. We're there for one another. We pick up shopping for people when they're not able to. When someone loses someone, when someone's grieving, when someone's hurting, when someone's confused, when someone's struggling, we stand together. We don't reject them. When someone is different, when someone has problems, when someone isn't the kind of nice, clean, middle-class, normal person that we would perhaps normally associate with, we love them and we welcome them and we include them with all their mess, exactly as they are, just as God does, just as he did me, don't we? That's what it is to be the church. So, we're now going to move into a time of communion and I'm going to ask the band if you could start making your way back, if you bring your communion elements with you and we'll take it together and you can start getting yourselves set. I'd like us to meditate as we share the bread and the wine, juice, whatever you've got together. This, this bread is broken. Jesus broke this loaf. And as we've been talking about today, there is an element of being broken that is part of our story. Well, it's, it's, there's an element of being broken that is part of being a human being. No one avoids this stuff. No one gets away with a life that is without brokenness. The difference is when we give our brokenness to God and we don't succumb to bitterness, and we don't uh, succumb to hatred, God can use our brokenness. He can use that fire to forge something that is actually beautiful and good and wonderful for us. So let's take this bread as we take our brokenness and give it to God. And then we take the cup, as it says in Paul's letters. It's the sign of the new covenant, forged, created in Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood means there is a whole new world. We're living in a new creation. You know, we're, we are in the kingdom of heaven now. Eternal life that begins today and goes on forever. It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's eternal life, it's the kingdom of heaven, it's a now thing that is forever lasting. That's the reality we enter into. So as we drink this, let's allow ourselves day by day to allow the Holy Spirit, also symbolised in the wine, to cast away the old paradigms, the old models, the old way of thinking, the old institutions and systems, and may we be washed and bathed in that new life. 
that new beginning that Jesus has given us, his grace, his love, his mercy, his gift of friendship with God. Amen. our time together um, with a, a song that um, will probably be familiar to some of you. Some of the parts of it will be familiar to others. Um, it's a, a more recent version of it as well. Um, I'd written down some different bits and pieces as Jamie was speaking and also in the week has been a song that's really been on my heart and actually just as Jamie's been speaking I feel like there are so many themes and phrases that Jamie's used that um, just really resonate I think with different parts of this song and um, I just but yeah just encourage you um, and pray that this will be um, a song that um, helps reassure or remind you um, of, a, of a God our God who is who is with us through through it all um, and what a bold thing it is to declare that it is well with our soul when the semantics and when the things, um, when the top notes in our lives don't necessarily feel that way. Um, but then another part I love of it is um, there's a, a bridge in this that says, let go my soul and trust in him as well. So. I just, yeah, I pray that there's part, parts of these songs, a full song or whatever it is, uh, I pray that that would speak um, to us now, that God would speak to us now. Um, and I also want to say that even if we feel we can't declare it right now, God carries us and holds us if the words are hard to say. So let's just join together. Um, in whatever way you feel you want to, whether that's, as we say, stood, sat, um, arms up, arms down, reflecting, being prayerful, whatever it is you need. Let's just um, share together in this time.
brings um, our time together this morning to a close. I pray you would carry the words you need to carry with you into the week ahead. And if, if anybody wants to, um, to chat, then do feel free to, to get in touch with us. There are various emails on the website. It would be really welcome um, to get in touch. So, yeah, Lord, um, we just um, lift this morning to you and um, we lift all that you have said um, through our time together. Um, and we thank you um, for the, the courage we have in you, the confidence we have in you, the comfort, the counsel that we have in you. We pray we would know that as we go into our weeks. Amen. Brilliant. Great to see you all here and um, all of those online as well. We will um, see you again next Sunday at the same time. Take care.